Okay, I think we'll start. And uh, if some people miss what I'm saying, it's not so important after all. So, good evening. Good evening, everyone. And uh, welcome. Welcome to the guests, the students, the faculty. And welcome to Professor Maureen O'Hara, who is our distinguished speaker tonight. We are uh, uh, super excited to have uh, Professor O'Hara uh, here. Um, as you know, Professor O'Hara is a, a leading expert of uh, market microstructure. She has made uh, fundamental contributions. She has even written uh, uh, an important textbook in, uh, in the field. Uh, she has worked on uh, informational efficiency, liquidity, uh, high-frequency trading. Um, and of course, she has worked also outside of market microstructure in banking and corporate finance. Uh, experimental uh, finance, experimental economics, uh, uh, distinguished uh, scholar. Professor Oara has actually even uh, written on ethics in finance. When people talk about, you know, think about finance people, they think, oh, these are nasty people who uh, never think about the rest of the world. That's not true, that's not true. Um, finance scholars do care about the rest of the world. Uh, the first uh, um, speaker in these annual lectures for the Center for Finance uh, was uh, Professor Jean Tirol. And Professor Tirol had just at the time uh, uh, a book on the economics for the common good. And uh, Professor O'Hara has written a book uh, some time ago which is called Something for Nothing, Arbitrage and Ethics on Wall Street. And I would like to read what uh, Tom Sargent uh, wrote about this book, because I think it's quite instructive. Tom says, something for nothing joins and extends a worthy tradition dating back at least to Adam Smith, who was both an eminent philosopher and an eminent uh, economist. In wrestling with how markets do or don't succeed in uh, channeling some of our base traits, greed and deception, in socially useful directions. Events surrounding the financial crisis and the ongoing project or crisis to construct a stable Eurozone have brought these always present issues to the fore. Maureen O'Hara's distinction as an economist who knows what makes sophisticated high frequency markets work lends a special credibility to her analysis. Getting these things right is important if the general public is to support wise regulation of these markets. And uh, I can only I can only second what uh, uh, Tom Sargent wrote about uh, about Maureen and uh, and uh, uh, Maureen's work. Um, I was in a in a in a in a conference in. Uh, uh, in New York a couple of weeks ago to celebrate uh, the achievements of my former supervisor was Professor Douglas Gale. And um, uh, one of the themes of, uh, of the conference was standing on the shoulders of giants. This is what science, where we give our little contribution based on what people better than us have done in the past. And you know, in my case, of course, a giant was Professor Douglas Gale with all this work together with uh, Professor Hallen, who has just joined us. Thank you for, uh, for coming. And another client is, of course, Professor Oara. Um, yeah, part of my research is indeed deeply uh, influenced by what Professor Oara has, uh, has been done. So for me, I can only say thank you for, uh, for, all, uh, for all that you did. Um, talking with Professor Oara uh, yesterday over coffee, I realized that uh, we have a few uh, interests in common, not just market microstructure, but also history of economic thought. And uh, Professor Oara reminded me yesterday that uh, you know, Jevons uh, was a student at UCL and a professor uh, at UCL. is the first person who introduced the word sunspots in, uh, in economics. Uh, to be fair, he didn't use it in the sense of today, but if today we say that bank runs are a sunspot equally, well, the word sunspot comes indeed from UCL, it comes, it comes, it comes from, uh, it comes from Jevons. Uh, so this is to say, that, you know, the, the finance group at UCL, the Center for Finance was established just uh, a few years ago, 
um, as I said, the first speaker for the inaugural lecture was Professor Tirol, and then we had Philip Lane, Hans Shin, um, uh, Lorenzo Binismaghi, and now uh, Professor Oara, because we mix academics and uh, policy makers. Uh, but, you know, it is built on, very, uh, on a very long, long, uh, long tradition. Anyway, um, thank you again, uh, uh, Maureen, for joining us. This is a great pleasure and honor for us. And uh, um, liquidity in a fragile world. This is what we are going to listen tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Well, thank you for the, for the lovely introduction, and, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it's, um, it's kind of a, a fun topic to talk about liquidity in a fragile world, and um, I hope what we're going to do today in this talk is really get an understanding of a couple of things. One of them is the fact that markets are changing, and in ways that maybe not be so good. Uh, those of you who seem to be a bit younger than those of us, uh, if we don't get this right, you're going to have crappy markets. So pay attention, because you're going to have to fix them uh, if I don't do it today. So that's, that's our goal. So let me start off and just talk a little bit about how we generally think about markets in the area that I work in, which is called market microstructure. And so generally, we say liquidity and price discoveries are, and price discovery are mainstays of microstructure research, right? What do you want a market to do? You want it to find the right price, and you want it to provide liquidity. We usually assume that more is better, right? So, you know, more price discovery seems like it's pretty clear, right? It's hard to come up with scenarios in which we want less price discovery. But the issue with respect to liquidity, I think, is trickier, right? Are instantaneously liquid markets really optimal? And that's something I want us to think about. And we're gonna, we're gonna have that in the back of our minds. We're gonna wander back to that at the very end. Now, I think that the interesting challenge when we begin to think about these things is it's not we're the, not the first people to think about liquidity. And as, as was mentioned, I actually liked history of thought. Uh, I spent a year as an undergrad at the University of Manchester, and I did a year in history of economic thought. So when I decided to go to grad school, I wrote my essay and said I wanted to study history of economic thought because I checked the course catalog, and sure enough, they had a course, a whole, whole year of them. Uh, history of Economic Thought at Northwestern, where I applied. <clears throat> and I, I learned two things which may be helpful for those of you who are thinking of this down the road. One, no one reads those essays. And two, don't count on the course catalog. Those courses hadn't been taught in at least 30 years, right? This was actually a really good thing, because instead of becoming a history of economic historian, which is going to be a lonely life, I got to be a finance professor. So. Uh, but it is helpful to think about these things. And in preparing sort of my talk here, I decided to go back and look and see what did economists think about liquidity. And fortunately, they didn't think about it a lot. So that's helpful. I found this very nice presidential address by uh, John Hicks in 1962. He was president of some royal society here. And his uh, presidential address was liquidity. And what he said was that prior to Keynes, no one talks about liquidity. So the good news is this only has a long-ish history. So we're actually going to start with Mr. Keynes. And here he is, right? He's an he's a imposing fellow. Um, so Keynes actually did talk about liquidity. And he was really among the very first to think of this as something that's important. And one of his famous, and in my view, very insightful quotes is this one. Of all the maxims of orthodox finance, none surely is more antisocial than the fetish of liquidity. The doctrine that it's a positive virtue on the part of investment institutes to concentrate their resources in the holding of liquid securities. It forgets that there is no such thing as liquidity of investment for the community as a whole. I think that is a lesson that we have been learning, again, rather frequently. Um, the UK gilt pension problem, which some of you may well be very familiar with, the COVID bond market crash in the United States, the US Treasury market problems, 
there is no such thing as liquidity for the market as a whole. And so what in the world will we do? You know, how are we going to deal with this? The basic problem is that no market can really work when everyone wants to sell and no one wants to buy, right? This is kind of, you know, when the Valrhazian auctioneer was put to work, right, he somehow managed to sort this out, but he's retired now. So we actually have to make the markets work. And there's a nice quote here. This is from Peter Bernstein. He's a kind of famous markets person. The institutional side of the market rests on the assumption that the other side of the market will always be there. Without that, even the gutsiest market maker would refuse to stay in business. So the issue then is what's been happening to the other side? Why are markets so fragile, right? We, we tend not to have had sort of the collapses that we had. For those of you undergrads may not realize how unusual it is that the central bank has to bail out a market. We got a, oh, an echo? Oh, sorry. Oh, dear. We'll come back. There we go. Um, and hang on a sec. Let's go back here. Um, so the Fed had to and basically be the market maker for the U.S. corporate bond market. Never happened before. The Bank of England had to step in and basically bail out the gilt market. That's, that just doesn't happen. So today we want to think about who is on the other side. And I'm going to apologize up front. I'm going to talk mostly about fixed income markets. The fixed income markets are the corporate bond markets, the treasury markets, the gilt markets. And, uh, but much of what I'm going to say re re relates more broadly. I'm going to draw on the research I've been doing over the last oh, five, six, seven years on bond market microstructure. And we're going to talk a little bit about how do you decide, how, you know, what are the problems and how could you maybe design markets to do better. I'm also going to apologize that I'm going to be using um, a fair amount of U.S. data because that's the data I've been working on. But I actually will have some nice pictures that we'll be looking at of the U.K. market uh, as well. So that's kind of to give you an idea of what we're up to. Um, I want to stress that I'm not the only person working on this. Um, and I also want to point out these are all research papers. And notice the dates. Bond market microstructure has attracted a lot of interest in the finance profession and economics more broadly because it, <laughs> the notion that your bond markets are going to fall apart is upsetting, to say the least. But bond market microstructure, for those of my colleagues, who I, I'm, my goal is to get every finance professor to become a microstructure person, we didn't work in microstructure on bonds much. We worked on equities. And um, the reason is a very simple one, data, right? The data on bond markets was not as good, and so finance is often viewed more as an empirical area, and without empirical data, you know, there's not a whole lot you can say. But now the data's getting better, and now you're seeing a variety of things. There's the bond market microstructure in general up there that I've worked on and others. Market instability in crises, this is a big issue. I mean, having markets collapse is, is a great way to get attention. And then finally, there's a, a, you know, a large developing literature in treasury and gilt markets. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So I, I just want to stress up front, I'm not going to actually talk about most of these papers, which I'm sure you're grateful for. But uh, I do want to stress that this is a great research area. Uh, so if you're applying to graduate school, don't say you're going into history of economic thought. Tell them you want to do microstructure and hope they read the essay. Um, so why is fixed income interesting now? I mean, most people thought of fixed income as not a particularly interesting area. Bond markets were bond markets, right? It's options, it's derivatives, it's crypto. That's where the action is. But bond markets are changing. And there are a variety of things that are affecting these markets. Increased capital charges from Basel III. So all the big financial institutions face capital charges, and that's where the big bond dealers are. So that cramps their style. Ambiguity from something called the US Volcker Rule. After the global financial crisis, 
the U.S. passed a, a huge reorganization of our bank regulation, and one of the rules was no proprietary trading for banks. The problem is that banks are mostly the market makers for fixed income markets, so it took a, a lot of figuring out where is the line there. Competition from electronic trading. The, the bond markets have traditionally been dealer markets. If you want to buy a bond, you have to go to a bond dealer. But now, the electronic markets have arrived, and so the markets are very different. The greater prominence of non-bank dealers, the hedge funds have discovered the bond markets and the sovereign markets. So you have these people called proprietary trading firms, PTFs. They're not traditional dealers like the, the bond dealers and banks. They're, they're firms that will be happy to buy and sell sometimes, and they're now a very large part of the market, even high frequency now. Uh, and finally, there's been a shift to something called riskless principal trading. So the way bond markets used to work is that a dealer, say someone who worked for Barclays, would have an institution call them up and they'd want to buy or sell some amount of bonds. These are markets that have very large trade sizes, right? So you can be talking 50 million and they want to buy up bonds. And the dealer might have those bonds in inventory or the dealer would know where they could get the bonds because they placed those bonds when they did the underwriting. So the dealer would sell you the bonds, right? And then you would hold on. And then at some point when you wanted to sell the bonds, you went back to the dealer and the dealer would buy it. Riskless principal trading says, I'll have the bonds. I'll tell you when I'll find somebody. And when I do, then I'll let you know and I'll match, right? So it goes, instead of making a market, you're matchmaking. These are all trends that have accelerated over the last few years. So I think the important thing is to sort of think about um, where we are right now. So we're going to try to all level set and see if we can get on the same page. Where I want to go is fixed income trading better or, or worse. You know, what's going on out there? So here's one thing that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, volumes are soaring. Right? So these are volumes, turnover of UK securities. Okay, we're not talking equities here, we're talking fixed income. So in recent years, the, the, the volume of, of trade is going through the ceiling. But here's the good news. Um, corporate bond transactions costs have collapsed, right? So bonds are really interesting in that if, if you want to go out and you want to buy 100,000 shares of, of stock, you're going to pay a big spread if you can even make that trade. Uh, but if you only buy you know, a little bit of stock, you'd have a tiny little spread between the buy and the, the, the bid price and the ask price, or the price to buy and the price to sell. Bonds are the opposite. Transactions costs are lowest for the very largest trades, and they're highest for the very smallest trades. That, that's the way this market works. But you can see that, that error is over, right? Transactions costs have collapsed for all trade sizes. So retail are the little ones. That's the blue line at top. And the black line at the bottom are block trades. These are monster block sales. Now everybody is paying essentially the same transactions costs. So that's a good thing, right? We like markets where the costs of transacting are low, right? So volumes are up, so people must like these markets. You know, transactions costs are down. Um, here's something else that's down, though, and that's the number of corporate bond dealers. So over a 10-year period, we lost approximately 40% of all the corporate bond dealers stopped dealing in bonds. Now, maybe they just got better at their jobs. <laughs> maybe something else is going on. But markets are bigger. Fewer bond dealers. So we're got an interesting sort of setup here. And this is not just in the US, right? It's here too, in the UK, and it's certainly true around in other countries. So this is a little chart from a paper that uh, uh, is written by uh, several co-authors, uh, Entry and Exit in Treasury Auctions in Canada. And, and they've lost you know, roughly 40 to 50% of their bond dealers too. So you got a, a market structure that's based on dealing with dealers. It's called an over-the-counter market. Market's growing. Spreads are small. Dealers are leaving. 
right? So it sets up sort of an interesting world. So what would we conclude? Well, one thing we might say is, I don't know, it doesn't look like it's a problem to me. You know, market looks great, low cost, nice high volumes, you know. Well, here I would go back to our friend Keynes. Uh, one of my favorite um, quotes from him is, uh, you know, he says the long run is for undergraduates. Now, that's probably insulting to undergraduates. Remember, he was in Cambridge. He wasn't here, right? The undergrads here, much better. Uh, but his point was, in the long run, So just because, in general, things look good, that's not really enough. So I think we're going to look at markets that way, too. We're going to say, OK, I like this, but is this enough? So let's, let's keep thinking, right? And here's this riskless trading that's also happening now. So instead of a dealer providing liquidity, he finds someone else who happens to just want to buy or sell that bond and matches them. And you can see here, there's this big jump. This is US data. And there's this big jump in sort of the middle of 2013. And that's when the Volcker rule, it starts to affect banks. Before, I mean, it was passed in 2009. But you know how these things are. What's the rush? But finally. By mid of 2013, banks had to comply. And they waited until the last minute. And then when they did, they're like, fine. We're, gonna, we're not going to trade as much as we used to. We're not going to take these things into, into inventory. So begin to see that these markets are sort of evolving. So what affects liquidity? And why are markets so fragile? So I think there are lots of causes, but I'm going to focus just on two. I want to talk about the changing dealer market, and I want to talk about market interconnectedness and see if they can help us understand why our market's fragile. So this is a nice picture from a friend of mine, Daryl Duffy, who gave me permission to use his slides, uh, his slide here. Um, so this, I think, is a very interesting picture. This is about the US Treasury market, and this is a picture the so the, the red line is the total big bank assets. So this is essentially the size of the banks that can do all the kind of trading that we're talking about, who can be the dealers, all right? And the blue line is the projected marketable treasuries. Uh, um, so you can see up until really the financial crisis, the capacity of the banks to be able to handle the treasury volume seemed OK. But then what happened, right? Well, we capped kind of the ability of the banks, if you will. Unfortunately, we did not cap the voracious appetite of the US Treasury. So the blue ones were the ones that were issued when this graph was put together. And the dotted lines were the projected borrowing in the US Treasury market. The, I'm sorry, the, the projected issuance in the US Treasury market. So where we are is that the amount of bonds now is huge. In fact, when you look around, the bond markets in general are huge, right? There's, you see here, the US corporate bond trading volume this year is averaging 40 billion a day. Treasury volume is clocking it at 600 billion a day in the US markets. Even here in the UK, I have your number here somewhere, but it seems to have gone around. Um, I'll find it at some point. The, the size of the markets is growing faster than the mechanisms that we use to put the traders together. That's a big problem. And obviously, a kind of scary graph. So I thought it might be fun to look at what happens when the market kind of breaks. So I'm going to look at a couple of examples. One here, I'm really focusing here on the dealers. This is the corporate bond market in the US during what we call the COVID crisis. So we had a financial crisis in March of 2020, when for a variety of reasons, I think the technical term is the market went berserk, right? It just, terrible things happened. So what you're looking at here, these are dates. You're wandering along. Along the 
you know, the, the vertical axis, you have cumulative dealer trading. So this is, what are the dealers doing, right? So, you know, the, if you want to sell, you're selling to a dealer, so the dealer has to buy. So you can see the dealers are kind of wandering along, and then what? Then when you get to sort of the middle of March, or actually the end of February, the dealers are not accumulating inventory anymore. They're stepping back. Their inventory is going down. And why is that? Because the treasury market in the US is now kind of under siege. Treasuries in, are in trouble. The dealers have to buy lots of treasuries, so they stop buying as many corporate bonds. And then what happens? Then the bond market falls apart, and then the dealers, instead of no longer just buying, they're selling. So you can see the dealers now, you know, they're dumping bonds. They join in the, the, the route, and they're selling. They don't want to own these things. And that's what causes the Federal Reserve to come in, those dotted lines. The Fed comes in, and what do they do? They start buying the bonds. Okay. This is not what you want in a market, that your central bank has to come in and rescue a market. But our bond market was basically falling off a cliff, and the dealers were running away. And that's a big problem, right? Because when the dealers run away, who's there? So this is sort of a, a picture. There's two sorts of dealers out there. There's primary dealers. These are dealers that are recognized by the Fed and can deal with the Fed. And then there's everybody else. But there aren't that many primary dealers. You can see they also went negative in terms of selling. The, that's the dark line. But the dotted line is all the other firms, and, and they're out of there. Right? These, are, these are proprietary trading firms. These are other dealers who are not connected with banks. They're not here. And they won't even come back until after the Fed has really sort of gotten this market stabilized. So when we say markets are fragile, this is what we mean, that everyone wants to sell and no one wants to buy. And you can see similarly here, these are the infamous all dealers, Volcker dealers, non Volcker dealers. At the height of this thing, you know, they don't want anything to do with this. So you might sit back and say, OK, fine. But times have changed. It's a new world. We don't need bank dealers like we used to. We have electronic trading, right? You told me earlier. You showed me on a slide. So maybe electronic trading can replace the dealers. Here's the problem. This is transactions cost during the crisis. So the, on the left side here, these are basis points. You don't have to know what they are, but they just how much is it going to cost you to trade. And then down there are the dates. And you can see the dark line is what happened to transactions costs for dealer to custom, customer to dealer trades, right? The dotted line is customer to customer trades, right? So as you look at this picture, one of the things that's really clear is that electronic trading is not particularly robust, right? It works great in normal markets, our infamous long run from earlier. Doesn't work so great when you have a stress situation in the market. And in other work that I've done, we found exactly the same thing. When you have a bond downgrade, Usually in the 30 days after, 60 days after a bond is downgraded, there's a lot of volume because a number of the mutual funds or whatever who included this bond now kick it out because it, it doesn't meet the criteria, so they want to sell. We found in research that we did that the electronic markets, their liquidity e-share of volume falls by more than a third during those periods. Electronic trading is not robust. And so as more and more of our trading goes electronic, how are we going to make these markets less fragile? It's a, it's a tricky one. So when we look at the dealer side of the world, what we see are fewer dealers and dealers who are not particularly interested in necessarily taking on large inventory positions. And so going back to our earlier question, who's on the other side? Well, I think we'll come back to that a little bit. But here I want to talk also about not just problems in the dealer market, but how market interconnectedness affects fragility, right? So we're going to talk about two things. We'll talk about your UK LDI guilt crisis. Uh, 
I'm sure some of you are experts on the guilt crisis and some of you not so expert. So we'll make assumption that we'll, we'll review for those of you who were not paying attention. Uh, and here I want to thank Gabor Printer for letting me use some slides from his excellent paper that the Bank of England did on the LDI crisis. And then I also want to talk and show you something called the U.S. Municipal Bond Crisis, um, the market interconnectedness, right? What's causing this? So let's take a, take a look at what was the LDI guilt crisis. So liability-driven investment is what LDI stands for. And it refers to hedging to undertake and to, to hedge an exposure to falling interest rates. Right? So you would think that um, as you think about who's, who, who, you know, who's afraid of falling interest rates, well, any kind of pension or insurance company really doesn't like falling interest rates. It's really bad because someday you may get a pension, promises you a certain amount of money. To get that certain amount of money, you know, your employer or whoever is putting aside the money puts in the money today and it's going to grow over time to the amount that you need. Low rates are disastrous for long-term investors like that. So what do you do? Well, UK pension funds were particularly exposed to falling rates because you still have largely something called a defined benefit structure here in the UK, which says when you retire, you get this amount. In the US, we are now in defined contribution, so you get kind of what you saved up over the years, so a little bit different. But having said that, it's still the case that pensions and, in, and insurance companies are very exposed to low rates. So what do you want to do? You want to hedge. You want to put yourself into another contract such that if the interest rates go down, the other contract's value will go up and you'll be better. So. One way to do it is to enter something called a get fixed pay variable interest rate swap, right? So those of you who are already falling asleep, let me try and wake you up. Interest rate swaps are really exciting, right? Here's the way it works, okay? I want to lock in that high current rate. And, and, and so what I want to do is I want someone to pay me a payment based on that high rate, and I want to pay them a payment based on a variable rate. If interest rates well, then my variable rate payment will go down, but my fixed rate payment that I'm getting will, go, will stay the same. That's how you would hedge the, uh, using an interest rate swap, um, falling interest rates. And in fact, I'm on the board of a very large retirement provider in the US, and we just entered into exactly that kind of position because we, wanna, we think interest rates are going down, and we want to lock in what are sort of historically high rates. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, what happened here is an interest rates on guilt, your government securities, went up sharply following the government budget release. So you're, you're, this is in September 2022. Your government announces this new budget. Market was not happy. Interest rates go up 20 basis points. That's, that's like you know one-fifth of a percent. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. And that's bad, right? Because as you know, when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. Okay, so if we're all with me so far, why is that a problem now? It's because that swap that I just entered into, well, you know, when interest rates go up, I'm the one who's losing, right? And so when you have a contract like that, you have to have posted collateral because I may turn out to be a deadbeat. So I have to post collateral that says, all right, fine, right? Here's, I'll have money that backs it up. Even if I am a deadbeat, you get the money. All of your insurance and pension guys, or pension really, had to come up with more collateral. So what did they have to come up with? They had to come up with more cash. Where are they going to get the cash? They had to sell their most liquid investments. What were their most liquid investments? Gilts. So now, let's, let's recap. Let's call this you know, sort of, we're, we're, we're at time out here. Let's recap the game. The insurance company, is ex your pension fund is exposed to falling interest rates. They hedge. They put themselves in a position where if, if rates go down, they, they, they win on, their, on, on, on things. They hedge themselves. 
But the problem is they go the other way. That hedge now is underwater. They have to come up with more collateral to get they, they have to sell securities. They sell gilts, they drive the gilt price. Um, you know, they drive the gilt price up. In, what, what I mean, bottom line is it's really bad. So the gilt price tanks because the interest rate goes up because they're buying. So this is very bad. What happens? The Bank of England has to step in and, and bail it out. So let's look at some pictures. This is the LDI sector, right? Here's the budget that gets announced in the, in the red line. And what are they doing? They are selling gilts. They're just dumping them. Why? Because they have to meet margin calls. They have to come up with cash. So this is the interconnectedness, right? In order to come up with cash, because your interest rate swap is now underwater, you had to sell the treasuries, which now tanks the treasury market. And so here's what's going to happen, the trade volume. Basically, they're trading against the dealers, but then sort of at certain points, the dealers just aren't going to buy from them, and so there's a gap. Is anybody buying? Well, here's the problem. They're selling. There's the asset. They're not doing anything, right? They don't want to do anything, and they don't, you know, you can see after the Bank of England ends its activities, they've got the market stabilized, everybody comes back. The hedge funds, you would have thought hedge funds might have run in. They don't do anything either. Uh, they don't want anything to do with this. They'll buy after the crisis is over, and then there's these others. We're not really sure they are. The problem is, who's on the other side? In this case, it turned out it had to be the central bank. And in the COVID case, it had to be the central bank. That's a really bad thing, right? As a microstructure person, I take it personally. That's a bad market design, right? We have to do something. So here's what happens to your trading costs. So trading costs, you know, before for bonds, they, they go way up, right, during this crisis because nobody wants to buy and everybody wants to sell. So this is kind of a bad thing, I mean, just in general. And it, it's broader than that. So I want to show you another crisis. So think of this as kind of a disaster movie. Or in the US, we have Shark Week, right? So you see all the movies where the shark eats various people. Here, we're going to see all the movies where the bond market gets eaten by various reasons. So in the US, we have something called municipal bonds. They're a very large um, fixed income class. They're issued by state and local governments. They're popular investments for individuals because you don't pay tax on the earnings to either the state or the government. They are generally held by retail investors who usually just hold them forever. And then um, they're very, you know, you don't trade them very much. Um, and there's a million issues. There's a million different issues of municipal bonds. Up until recently, these were all held by individual investors. They didn't trade. There were no such thing as crises in municipal bond markets. But in the past decade, municipal bond mutual funds have become popular. So as many of you know, the mutual fund buys up a whole bunch. You can trade in and out of your mutual fund. So you take what was traditionally a very illiquid asset, and you put it in a very liquid sort of, of wrapper. What's kind of fun here is that with the million issues, some of them never trade. But if you look at issues that did trade over the, our sample period, approximately 30% of the issues that traded were held at least in part by mutual funds. And the other 70% the mutual funds had nothing to do with. So we have a really nice sort of control group here. We have bond issues issued by the same issuers, right? But some issues will be included in, municipal bond, in mutual funds and other issues won't. And so what happens here? Well, what happens here is there COVID crisis hits, our bond markets are falling apart, our treasury markets are falling apart, and all of a sudden everybody's nervous. And so the mutual funds, the investors rush to sell. So the mutual funds, if you're going to redeem your mutual fund, then the fund has to sell the underlying 
you know, entity in which are bonds. So here are the flows to the mutual bond funds, and you can see they fall apart, right? That's a stunning drop in one, one day. And then what, right? Well, there's the, there's the trading volume over there in red, the, the daily flows to municipal bond markets. Um, so the, these markets hemorrhage. The, the, the mutual fund investors panic, and they want out, right? Who's supposed to buy all these bonds? The same dealers who had to buy the treasury bonds and had to buy the corporate bonds, they now have to turn around and buy the municipal bonds. And which municipal bonds do they have to buy? Well, the black line are issues that are not held by mutual funds. So the, the retail investors didn't actually panic about the municipal bonds. It's the mutual fund that caused this entire problem. So you can see that the trading volume of muni bonds goes to the ceiling, right? All of a sudden, a sleepy little market, which was kind of pretty much the same, right, before the crisis, now it explodes. And it's all caused by the, minu, minu, the mutual fund redemptions. So now what happens? Dealers run away. Okay? So again, where are the dealers? They run away. This is the inventory picture, much like we saw before. You can see that. Prior to the lines that go up and down, you know, the dealers are putting inventory pretty much even between the municipals that are mutual funds and municipals that aren't. But then what? The crisis hits. They start buying the issues that are in the mutual funds, and then they give up, and they run away. And they run away from the others, and they keep running away, and they don't come back. So the dealers just, we're out of here. Right? Now, this is kind of interesting. The Fed does create a program to lend money to the dealers, as opposed to the other programs where the Fed and, in your case, the Bank of England actually physically buy things. But here they don't do that. And so this thing just continues to be a problem, and the market still continues to have issues. And this is, I think, the, the, the graph we really liked in the paper. Now, all of a sudden, everybody has woken up to the fact that what they thought was a sleepy little market is not a sleepy little market, that these illiquid municipal bonds are actually going to be subject to a run risk that we never knew about. And so you can see, whereas before, this is yields. So this is what the, you, know, you, you get on a municipal bond. You can see that prior to the crisis, the yields on the bonds that were in the mutual funds and the yields on the bonds that were not in the mutual funds, those issues, they're approximately the same, but not afterwards. Now, the bonds that are getting put into mutual funds, they've got a run risk, and it's priced, and it doesn't go away. So what's the point of all this is interconnectedness, right? Now, part of what's happening in these markets, we have dealer markets that are smaller, not as heavily capitalized, we have markets that are bigger to begin with. And then you have to worry about not only your market, but all the other markets that are going to affect your market. So it's kind of a mess. So how can we fix it, right? I know you've been sitting on the edge of your seat wondering, how are we going to fix these markets? Let me see if we can suggest a couple of things. So there's a variety of suggestions out there. Central clearing of trades. In some settings, like swaps, Maybe if you could centrally clear everything, you could net one swap off after another. That would be a good thing. But bond markets don't really lend themselves to that. Um, you could change bank regulation. Why did all of our dealers run away? I think two things. One, the bank regulation made being a dealer more expensive. Their costs went up. And two, electronic trading drove down the, the spreads. So here's the good news. Your costs are higher and your, and your revenues are lower, right? So why did we lose 40% of our bond dealers? Probably because it's not profitable. You could count on other non-dealer participants, right? Maybe there's others out there who want to come in. You could improve disclosure. You could try and let people know kind of what's going on. And you could consider new methods of trading. Now, those are broad, right? So I'm going to talk about two. But first, 
I want to go to the, are there natural buyers? This is Warren Buffett, be greedy when others are fearful, right? So who is this addressed to? It's addressed to long-term investors. So insurance companies, pension funds, right? When others are fearful, you should run in. Now you may think, well, what about hedge funds? Aren't they greedy? Yeah, but they're greedy all the time, right? This is supposed to be greedy only when the markets are problematic. So who might that be? Well, insurance companies are one group. Insurance companies tend to have long-term you know, liabilities um, because people don't generally cash in insurance policies overnight. And, and they have a long-term horizon. And so sure enough, we looked at what happened with insurance companies during the crisis. The, this is the uh, COVID crisis. And here what we find is kind of fun. So up top there the, is cumulative inventory of the dealers, right? So remember, the dealers are running away during the COVID crisis. But the insurance companies are actually buying. And it makes sense because this is a value opportunity, right? Put it this way, the bonds are on sale, right? So you have insurance companies coming in as a potential person to buy. And one of the things we found was really interesting when we were looking at these insurance companies, that it's not just that they bought, that they, they also were very selective in what they did. They had dealers that they had dealt with in the past, so they had a relationship with them. They basically bought from the dealers that they had relationships with, and they sold to the dealers that they didn't, right? And so if you had a long-term relationship with an insurer and you were a dealer, you were in good shape because you had a client who was willing to buy. And since you didn't want to buy anymore, this was great. And not only that, because you had a stable source who you could sell bonds to, what we found was dealers who had stable insurance clients set lower transaction costs for every one of their clients. So somehow, if we can figure out a way to make these other investors, the value investors, be more willing to come in, that may be partial of the solution. How would we do that? Maybe we could um, change some of the requirements on insurance companies. They have capital and all kinds of issues. But the insurance companies definitely kind of raced in and tried to fix the problem, um, which I think is kind of fun. And here you can net deal inventory, five billion insurers were in, they bought, were net buyers of roughly 2.5, so if they weren't there, the dealers would have been out 1.5. Um, in general, relationships here really mattered. So what about new trading methods, right? This one's kind of fun and may not be familiar to most of you. There is now something in the bond market called bond portfolio trading. So what this is, is that these are giant trades that involve, you know, could be a hundred bond issues all in one trade. And so now a dealer has to step up and buy this giant trade. Now you may sit there if you followed this and said, I don't know that dealers would want to do that. But it turns out that they do. I'll talk about why. These are now six to nine percent of U.S. daily bond trading volume. They're huge uh, issues. And you sit back and say, wow, why are these bond trading volumes so useful? Well, in our sample here, we found that 80 percent of all traded issues were included in at least one portfolio trade. So portfolio trading is now becoming a much more popular way to trade. And why is that, right? Well, you can see the number of dealers who are big enough to handle this is growing. When this thing starts back in 2016, is the first one, 2017, there were maybe five dealers who were big enough to handle this. Now we're up to about 20. So this is a market that huge trades, but dealers like it. And why is that? Well, part of what's going on is a diversification story. So when a dealer buys a portfolio that has 100 units, 100 different bonds, you can see it as uh, erratic risks. And 
healer, systemic risk. That with the index derivatives. Before, bonds were very difficult to necessarily hedge. So remember earlier, my hedge is what got us into trouble with the LD. This is really about lowering the risk to the dealer because the dealer buys these great big things and now they've got a better position they can hedge and they're happier to do it. And so when we look at the transactions costs, we find that the transactions costs of portfolio trades are much lower than the transactions cost of individual issues that trade, which is kind of fun. Those of you who, again, I want everyone to do microstructure research. The way these things get reported is that a price for every one of the, the bonds that's in the portfolio. So when you look at the tape, what you're going to see is like 100 different prices for each of these individual units. And that's really nice because then I can look and see how did they trade on their own, right? And the results here are really surprising. Uh, portfolio trading is uh, somewhere. Where did he go? Um, one sec. I lost this. Um, it's particularly good for um, less liquid bonds. They're the real winners. Not only are liquid bonds winners, but less liquid bonds are, better, are winners, and twice as much. So basically, portfolio trading is one solution. But here's the, here's the bad side. This graph says, yeah, in general, part of a portfolio trade, yeah, it's great. 11 basis points less cost if you're in a portfolio trade, and that's a lot. That's like 40% of your bond costs. Except when you want one during a crisis, in which case your portfolio trade costs will go through the ceiling and you will pay an additional 73 basis points to be part of a portfolio trade. So where are we? Back in the same mess. The portfolio trades are great for the long run, but they won't work during the short run. So we've been talking for quite a while. Let me see if we can kind of tie things up for you. I think the key here is that liquidity is not a given, right? Markets seem more fragile than in the past, and they are, right? Are instantaneously liquid markets really optimal? The answer is no, and we actually knew that answer. And we know that answer from equity markets, so stock markets. If, if you think about stock markets, there was a time when they seemed to be crashing, and they don't seem to be doing it now. And why is that? Because when we have problems in, in stock markets, we have an advantage. They trade in exchanges. And we learned that the way to stop problems when you have instability in a stock market is to slow the market down. So in the old days, we would have trading halts for the whole market. So if the market really went down a whole bunch, you're like, fine, we close the whole thing. We don't do that anymore. What we learned after the flash crash in the United States, when markets with, had become sort of saturated with high frequency trading and they, they didn't seem to behave the same way, we had to change the market structure. And here's what we did. We found back when we had a flash crash that because of high frequency trading, you could get 1,000 buy orders in a second. That would wipe out your book, right? So you have a book of orders. All these orders came and they wipe it out. That, that price will go to zero, right? You could get 1,000 sell orders the next second, but they're not synchronized, and by then your market fell apart. So how do we fix it? When you start getting those 1,000 buy orders in this millisecond, and the price, you start working through the book and the price starts to drop, you have preset limits and then you stop. It can only go so far. This is called limit up. You stop the market, you wait five minutes for what? For orders to arrive, fill up the book. Then you reopen the market. If, if in fact it was just a liquidity issue, the market will be back up. If it's not a liquidity issue, there was really bad news, the market down again, but you'll hit another limit up or limit down, you'll slow the market down. And that's why we don't have crashes now, right? We've realized that a way to solve the problem is to slow markets down, to not have instantaneous liquidity. 
But we can't do it here. And we can't do it here because bonds don't trade that way. They don't trade on exchanges. They trade in dealer markets. They trade in dispersed settings. So it's a challenge, right? How are we going to come up with this? You know, can we find really brave hedge funds who decide they want to do this? I'm not optimistic. Can we come up with another market design that could kind of help us get here? That I'm more optimistic, but I'm not entirely sure what it is, right? I'm afraid if we don't, then the solution is going to be the central bank is going to become the dealer. And that's a solution that I don't think any of us, and particularly Mr. Keynes, would have wanted. So I'm going to quit there. Thank you for your attention. I'll take questions if there are any. Bold crowd. Uh, any questions out there? Okay, sorry, just before you start. Maria, if you want to sit, you're welcome, or if you prefer I'm to good. stand. I'm good. Uh, I have to ask you to speak up, because unfortunately the microphone doesn't work, so you have to speak up, especially for the people who are following uh, from home. Tell us your name and uh, speak up. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm Joseph. Maybe the question is a bit too basic, but... Uh, so, just to be clear, the reason why in the bond markets higher uh, volumes have comparatively lower uh, transaction costs is because it's on the market, so you need to find a counterpart. And, or so, Maureen, before you answer, I have been instructed that I have to repeat the question for people at home. Okay, so, friend is, uh, is, is uh, happy. So your question is, why is there this difference between equity markets and bond markets? Is it because, uh, you know, uh, people are not trading on the exchange or they're in different places? I wasn't sure that was your question. Is that the question? Yes, sort of. So why in the bond market with larger quantities it's cheaper? Or it was cheaper and it's not, not, not so much longer the case? Why? It is cheaper. I mean, it, the bond prices, the transaction costs in, in bond markets have gone way down, right? Why for larger quantities? It's oh, like it's for cheaper. So here's the interesting thing. When, when you think about, um, that's a good question. All right? So why is it that when you have big trades in stocks, you pay up, if you will, and when you have big trades in bonds, you get a good deal? That's, that's the question. So one way to think about it is that you can divide sort of assets into two groups. One group are we'll call information assets, and the other group we'll call inventory assets. All right, so what's an information asset? Well, that's, a, that's an asset whose value is going to be driven by new information about what's going on. So you become very enthusiastic about Tesla. You know, you decide you want to buy Tesla. You, you heard that Elon Musk is doing something not crazy this time. And, and so you run out. And so you're trading on what you think is information. So generally, we think stocks are much more affected by information. And, when someone wants to, to sort of buy a whole lot, then you kind of worry, well, maybe they really know something, right? Whereas if someone's only buying a little bit, they probably, you don't. Know. So the information is kind of what generally drives up the transactions costs in information markets like stocks. But bonds, you know, bonds, you know, you, you're promised a return, right? Even if Tesla does really well, if you buy Tesla bonds, you don't get any more, right? So bonds are viewed as inventory markets because what generally causes their prices to move a lot is um, that you know, ability to find the bonds, right? And so dealers actually like to have these big trades in part because th th these are coming from institutions, right? These are coming from giant institutions who are not trading on information so much as they are trading just because of uh, in, of, of flows in and out. So that's traditionally been it. The bond market has not been a retail market. It is a market for institutions. And then retail guys started buying it, but dealers don't like these little bitty trades, and so they charge you a fortune, is sort of the short answer. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, uh, one second. We Oops, sorry. ordered uh, sorry. the lady there. Oh, sorry, sorry. Speak up, please. Tell us your name and speak up. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you, in the recent trends, there's been the big banks taking over much more of the market share than the more sort of proprietary banks, which are sort of driving a lot of the liquid trading. Do you think this trend is sort of shifting towards less use of electronic trading no. and therefore taxing fragility? I don't think Maureen, electronic... Maureen, maybe um, Sorry, I keep just forgetting. in the interest of our friend, me. maybe you want to repeat very shortly the question and the answer. So the, the question is, do you think that the big banks sort of expansion in these areas will, will temper electronic trading and everything will go back to the banks? I don't. I think electronic trading is here. Um, it, is, um, it is just much more efficient and, and can lead to lower trading prices, which is what we've seen. So. I don't think the electronic trading is going anywhere. What we are seeing in electronic trading is many new ways to trade, right? So it, 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 electronic trading started off as something called request for quote, which really meant that there were dealers on the other side, right? So these guys are all dealers, and if I went into an electronic trading venue, I could say, okay, I'm pre-cleared to deal with these five guys, send them my order. But that was still dealer to customer. Now what we're seeing in electronic trading is all kinds of interesting things, customer to customer, right? You're a giant um, investment firm, maybe you're dimensional fund advisors. You buy securities not based on what they actually are, but on their characteristics. If someone wants to buy a Ford 28 bond, I got it, I'll sell it to you, because I don't care. I can find another bond with those characteristics. So there are going to be new entrants, I think, coming in here. What stops that from growing as fast as it should is that the non-dealer participants aren't sure what the bonds are worth. And so one of the new growth industries is the quant industries that come up and basically come up with bond pricing models to tell you, well, this is what the bond is worth. We haven't had good data like that. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be that way. I think we're still going to see growth of electronic trading. I think it's a good thing that the big banks are still willing to be in there, because at the moment, you know, the electronics don't hold up in stress times. So it's going to be a very interesting period going forward. Thank you, Anastasia. Please. So I've actually got a question about... Tell us your name. Tell us your name. My name is Matthew Mesmori, and uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you. And my question is actually related to electronic trading. So you say that during stress times, electronic trading does not hold up. But I'm curious, with the developments of stuff like cloud technologies and sort of the sort of increasing infrastructure to more data and allowing for more traffic at any given time, do you think that that's going to improve that sort of field and actually maybe increase electronic trading's presence at overall? Okay, please repeat the question. I'm sorry about that, but unfortunately the microphone uh, is, uh, is a problem. So the question is whether at a certain point electronic trading could help also in periods of crisis, right? That's the well, with, basic point. With more data. With more data. More data. More data would help, but you know, the, the way the markets worked in the past, right? The, the reason the dealer was willing to buy is that it was a repeat game. Right? So, you know, the dealer bought, the dealer sold you the bonds in the first place. Now they'll buy them back. You're going to, this is an institutional market. We're going to do hundreds, thousands of transactions. So, this was a relationship market. Electronic trading is a transactional market, right? Because, you know, whoever is on the next side of, the trend of an electronic trade may not be the same person on the previous one. So, the, the sort of movement from relationship markets to transactional markets, I, I don't think the cloud is going to help, right? I mean, the cloud may help some firms feel better about saying, maybe I'll step up and buy. But what we observe now, right, is the head funds run away. You know, if anybody had access to information, it's them. They don't want to do it, right? They, they don't want to be there. And so maybe, you know, maybe the cloud will do it. Maybe we'll have AI, scary thought. Uh, 
right? We have algorithmic trading in lots of markets. Maybe we'll program little AI uh, bond traders who um, have no steel and big capital accounts. Uh, but I think we're a long way away from that. But it's a very good question. Thank you. There was another question. Uh, please, please, you. Okay, so why are you skeptical on central clearing? <laughs> so, I think central clearing, the main role that it plays is it lets you to net out, right? So, you know, if I'm waiting for collateral from somebody so I can use the collateral for you, right? then the, the market just kind of freezes because we wait for everybody to do, and in the meantime, uh, I can't. I can't do that, right? So central clearing would help because if you know, if 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 you owe, if person A owes person B and person C owes person A, we can net all that out. But clearing and um, so clearing can solve some problems. I agree, and it's great for things like swap markets. It's you know the the credit default swap markets. When you look before the crisis. The VIS said there were 61 billion or so trillion of credit default swaps outstanding. Why was that? Because you couldn't undo a credit default swap, right? Once you went to netting, then you can get out of them, right? You can net them out. With bonds, I'm not sure that it's clearing that's the problem, right? I mean, there's the the clearing is still someone has to be willing to buy these things, right? After I buy it, we'll clear. But, I, you know, if everybody wants to sell and nobody wants to buy, it doesn't matter how we clear it. There's, there's nothing to clear. There's no trade. And so that's why I'm not particularly, you know. Now, is there another solution? What if we, what if we trade it on exchange? Right? I mean, the Italian government bonds trade on exchanges. But interestingly enough, U.S. treasuries don't. You're don't. I mean, we could put bonds back on an exchange. The problem with that, I think it would work for sovereign debt, but it won't work for regular bonds because there's too many issues that never trade. If you put it on exchange, you could wait weeks for the other side to show up, right? So that's why I'm not I'm totally with, with Daryl where central clearing makes sense, but it's not going to solve this problem, is my view. Thank you. Um, next question. Just one second. First, that gentleman there. Uh, Speak I'm up, please. Sure. Hi, I'm Sean. Um, thank you for the insightful lecture. I personally thought that the lecture ended off a little bit of a cliffhanger because you mentioned <laughs> um, in the exchange market, like the Italian government bonds could be trading on exchange. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the benefits of that and what you think that the future of bond trading Um, when you write, oh, sorry. You can, you can repeat the question uh, quickly. I think the, quickly, the yeah. question is, if we don't take them back on the exchange, what are the key developments to fix it? Is that it? Yeah. So, you know, that's the kind of research that I do and other people do. I think things like portfolio trading may help because what? It reduces risk. The, the reason you can't get people to be on the other side is it's too risky. So how do we make it less risky? Right? I think the regulators are looking at this too. Maybe they got a little carried away. They made the, they, they, they made the banks too safe, and then they pushed people out, and they made the markets less safe. That's a bad idea, right? Um, 
You know, I, I think this is an area where there's a lot of discussion, but not a whole lot of answers. Uh, so yeah, I, I wanted a cliffhanger because I'm hoping all of you will solve this when you get a job and, you know, or, you know, come up with a good idea. Uh, Thank you. Um, oh, yes, please, that was you. So the effect of uh, regulation or less regulation on the less regulation on the high frequency market, what would be any implication? So, another very good question. One of the things that's interesting is HFT is kind of the main liquidity provider provider in equities, right? They just are. And when this first happened, you know, the regulators were all upset, you know, HFT, these are evil, you know, they're they're really fast and, and we don't understand it. And, and, and then all of a sudden we began to realize that actually HFTs are what are providing liquidity and equities. Which is why we had to change the market structure in equities to slow down when we had problems. Because the HFTs kept moving in and out so fast that when we became illiquid. The HFTs are everywhere, right? They're in FX and um, you know, the FX markets couldn't survive without HFTs, and they provide the bulk of the liquidity there. FX markets haven't had quite the problems that we've seen in the bond and sovereign markets. HFTs have not played as large a role in bond markets, but they, they're there now. The challenge with HFTs, you know, a lot of these, a lot of bonds don't trade very often. So it doesn't help to be fast if the next trade is 20 minutes from now. And so there are kind of natural constraints on the HFTs in, say, corporate bond markets. I, I don't think they're going to play that big a role. Um, in sovereigns, yes. Um, are HFTs a good thing? In my view, generally, yes. Right? But HFTs are also very opportunistic. And, um, you know, HFTs are great for moving liquidity from here to there. But if, if there's illiquidity here, they'll move, they won't do, you know, they're just gone. So I, I'm not sure HFTs are the solution to bonds, but they may be. I think we'll have to wait and see how the strategies and the algos that they use. Right, algorithmic trading has been relatively new to bonds. And, um, but it's coming. And, um, in some settings, it's already there, like some of the sovereigns. So it's a very good question. Please, that next is you. Yeah. Nice, nice sweatshirt. Yes. <laughs> that was a, that was done on purpose, right? Maybe you should uh, show the <laughs> to the camera so that they understand the joke. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky you. So the student from Cornell asks uh, whether international bonds might uh, have a different market from uh, local bonds, probably more liquidity. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the interesting things is that bonds, the big issuers, issue global bonds now, right? I mean, IBM has issues everywhere, right? In, in, every, in every kind of, of currency. Um, one of the big issues with bonds is, is just, um, you know, you need to have, um, I'm trying to think of the right way to phrase it, certainly bigger is better, right? If there's more people holding a bond issue, there's more people who can buy it and will buy it. Um, if U.S. bonds 
are more attractive. Interestingly enough, you know what's been a big seller in Europe has been minis taxable municipal bonds. You know, and my, I was really puzzled. Why in the world are Europeans buying municipal bonds? Well, it's because our municipal bond yields are 5%, and your bond yields have been like one, right? So to the extent that we can expand the universe, that's a good thing, right? The problem, and, and, and that's like at the institutional level. I think that's a good thing. Retail is a bit more problematic because retail takes, you know, illiquid bonds and packages them in a liquid wrapper. And the more illiquid bonds you do that with, the more, in some sense, risk that you run that you'll have fragility. So I think it's great if we have greater institutional ownership of corporate bonds. I'm not quite so crazy about having greater retail ownership. Thank you. I, I think, Maureen, I'll ask you a question, which is, uh, uh, you know, the, the events that you are referring to are somehow rare events, like COVID, for instance, right? So, you know, to go back to some work that Franklin did with Douglas, I mean, financial crisis may also be, be optimal to some extent, right? So, is this such a big problem that once in a while we have a, a serious disruption in the market? It's a bit of a provocative question. So I think I have two answers. One, crises are great for finance professors because like, like Franklin here and me, this is great. When markets fall apart, I can write three and four papers. You know, it's wonderful. We have PhD students here. You can get tenure if you get enough of these crises, right? But for society, it's, it's less obvious that this is a good thing. Now, I admit that sometimes when you get a crisis because you get markets that get kind of overheated, they get crazy, you know, and, and people think that trees grow to the sky, and, and so you have like GameStop uh, and, and things. I, I don't know that Robin Hood operates here, but, um, you know, you get these crazy valuations of things where people, you know, just keep piling in and, you know, you feel bad when it crashes and then leaves, maybe, but maybe they have to learn. But when a bond market crashes, that's a very bad thing, in my view. And it's a very bad thing because it, it just reflects the fact that we now no longer have a mechanism that is elastic enough to create the liquidity. And so, so what do you have to do? There is no one else. The central bank comes in. Now, those of you who follow Japan, right, Japan went out and bought everything. Right? The Bank of Japan owns all the equities, they own all the bonds, they own all. You can certainly do that. You could have the central bank be the counterparty, but that is not a functioning market. And, you know, if I agree that these are rare, but these are, these are like 100 year floods that are happening now every 10 years. I don't know how rare these things are, right? We keep, you know, for a while we were having lots of crises in equities, and then we kind of have them as much. I think we're at that point in fixed income. We have to figure out a different structure. And um, we're just at the beginning of figuring that out. So it is a cliffhanger. I don't have the answer. But um, I think when the central bank bails out your bond market, it's, it's not just a bad thing. It's a really bad thing. Well, you, you know, your, your example of the finance professor is, uh, was very, very, very funny. I have another example because of what happened in this country with Liz Truss, you know, governments like the Italian government now are super careful because they are super scared that there will be another Liz Truss <laughs> moment. So, you know, sometimes other countries can learn from, uh, from mistakes. So uh, I, I would follow that up. I was given advice once by a fourth grade teacher who assured the class, and I believe me at the time, that no one's life is ever wasted. You can always serve as a bad example. So I've tried to live up to that, and, and uh, perhaps that's where you're going. I mean, Maureen and I, and, and I can go ahead with, the, uh, with these anecdotes, but maybe, uh, maybe you prefer to have some drinks. Oh, there is another question? I don't no, think so. no, there the are some drinks. When is the reception? When is, when is the reception? It's in the South Cloisters, and if you just follow our great students, ambassadors, they will uh, uh, lead us there. But before we do that, thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.
Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, I keep forgetting things. I think of Liz Truss and then I forget things. Uh, Maureen, do you know this person? Let me show it to you. If you don't, don't worry because I didn't, but... You know this? Uh, Jessica Parker. Sarah Jessica Parker. Yes. So, so this is uh, uh, this is because I'm going to give Maureen uh, uh, an amazing, which has become a very fashionable because Sarah Jessica Parker wore it in New York City, and so this is the most uh, important bag in the world right now. Uh, this is uh, another gift. Uh, excellent. We're Go. And uh, this is uh, our uh, uh, hoodie, but uh, uh, you, know. you know, so <laughs> we have plenty of things. Not only Cornell has hoodies, but also. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. we'll figure out how to get